is Teresa Pollock, and she's also from California, from Santa Barbara University of California, and she is uh, uh, one of the uh, members of the advisory group for this issue. And in the moment, she serves as a chair from, uh, in the materials department at the University of California. She holds a PhD degree from the MIT, and uh, she started her career at the um, GE aircraft engines, where she worked then on advanced superalloys for gas turbine engines. In 1991, she joined the materials science and engineering faculty at the Carnegie Mellon University, where she was the Alcoa professor until 1999. And then she moved to the University of Michigan. After uh, she, she was elected um, to the National Academy of Engineering in 2005, and uh, as TMS Fellow in 2009. She was TMS President in 2005, and uh, her current interests include the mechanical and environmental performance of materials in extreme environments. Okay, so, Teresa, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Hanka, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I hope that we caught some of the people as they walked by. So um, my, assign my assignment today, as I understood it from uh, Gopal, was to cover some of the territory between discovery of new materials and their translation to uh, engineering. And um, I think it's no accident that Gopal picked a, uh, selected three speakers who had really long flights because uh, a FedEx package with this uh, bulletin showed up on my doorstep right before I left for the airport. And I had the pleasure of uh, reading the entire thing on the way here. And it's, it's really very well done. So uh, congratulations. All right, I'll get further away. Is that better? OK, good. So. Um, Yes, as you heard, I, I uh, have had both industrial as well as academic positions. And uh, so I was asked to sort of uh, say a little bit from both perspectives. And so I'll attempt to do that without uh, a great amount of detail uh, about my research, but rather uh, with, a, with an eye to what's going on with regard to these translational issues, both uh, at MRS and, and in the broader materials community. OK, so um, let's start with materials discovery. I think everyone is here today because uh, they have a passion for this part of the problem. And uh, we have a fantastic uh, toolbox to work from. And uh, some of us spend a lot of time uh, where the orange circles are. And there are, uh, in my mind, near, nearly limitless variations of macromolecules and copolymers and, and molecular architectures and so forth. And so uh, that means to me that there's nearly limitless uh, opportunities for discovery. If you sort of uh, swing more to, toward the hard materials and uh, wander through the central parts of the periodic table, it's, it's remarkable how little we still know. Uh, if you take perhaps the 81 useful elements and ask yourself how many binary, ternary, quaternary uh, diagrams there should be to uh, describe the behaviors of these systems, uh, it goes from 3,240 to 85,000 to uh, nearly 5 million. And of course, you know, within each one of those uh, systems, there are an infinite, almost infinite number of, of states uh, that we go through as we process materials. And so it's safe to say there's, again, a lot that we don't know in these systems. And just to uh, highlight that point, we actually have a pointer here. Uh, if, if you imagine a ternary diagram, for example, and a binary to start with, I guess, if you imagine a binary diagram and ask yourself, oh, 
if you ask um, how many of those binary diagrams have unique compounds that sit in the center of the system, there's basically two additional compounds for every If you go now to the, if you go, no, we're having a lot of problems here. Okay. Now, if you go to the um, three combinations, there's 13,000. So there's only like one per every five. And if you go to fourth order systems, there's only a few known compounds that don't appear in any combination of the ternaries. And in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, somebody reported say, a new L12 intermetallic uh, that didn't exist in any of the constituent ternaries, but suddenly appeared in quaternary space. So, so in all of these cases, there's still plenty of room for discovery. I think there's some discussion about this in the articles in the journal. And uh, I would argue that there's, there's plenty of space left there. Now, speaking of space, the article uh, written by Jim Williams, I think, sort of shows this nicely. If you sort of look back in time at an Ashby map and how much of the space is actually occupied by available materials, uh, you can see that the space is, is rapidly expanding. And Julia just showed us uh, one of the ways of doing that a moment ago. And so, so the discovery part, I think, is alive and well. And uh, again, that's why many of us are here. Now, um, the bigger problems come when we think about translating these materials that we know and love into engineering products. And um, this usually takes one of two paths. And I predicted that Colin would talk about that path, and he did. Uh, we can think about startups and uh, taking the, the new materials to market in that mode. There are two excellent articles uh, that talk about the challenges of doing this uh, in the issue. And so I encourage you to look at those. The other mode would be uh, to go with some of the more conventional, well-established companies who need these materials, but also have fairly uh, strict systems for maturing materials from the time they're discovered until the time uh, that they're actually uh, used. And there are examples in the issue from both aerospace as well as automotive. And of course, we know well that we'd like all of those systems to be safe. And so there's a very good reason why it's difficult to get new materials into those systems. And so this, of course, always immediately ensues uh, to a discussion of the valley of death. And uh, this is a well-known problem. There are three. Uh, papers in the issue that spend some time on this topic. And the Valley Death really is this uh, big chasm between uh, the prototype and the actual application. And I show a figure here from the paper by Williams and Banerjee. And I like this figure because uh, they actually uh, spent a little bit of time mapping out what's in the Valley of Death. And so these concentric circles I've, I've written here uh, some of the things uh, that they view as most important about the Valley of Death. And I'll say a few more things about a couple of them. So if you look in this first column, there's a lot of words about um, supply security, uh, geopolitics, the supply chain. And this really comes down to how scarce are the materials that we'd like to use. And I show here a couple of charts from my colleague Ram Sasadri at UCSB. And you may not be able to see it very well, but basically he's plotting uh, scarcity and the, the HH index, which really sort of captures other aspects of scarcity in terms of production or uh, politics of not being able to access uh, certain materials in certain regions of the world. And so as you go from blue to red, uh, we become more scarce and, uh, um, of course, much riskier. Now this shows up uh, in all classes of materials. Thermoelectrics are sort of the current one where you see this a lot. We have a way of plotting figures of merit. We want to think about ZT. And, and so then we go and harvest the properties or predict the properties and, and look for high ZT. But if you plot scarcity on this axis against the HH index, of course, we'd like to be down here in the corner where we have things that are not scarce 
and that are going to be available. And um, what you'll see is that uh, this is a good way of, of guiding the search because uh, some of the things up here that have very good properties of thermoelectrics simply aren't going to be available. And so that would be the first question the academic is asked when they go to someone uh, to make their thermoelectric. Where would I get that material and why would I want to, to make anything out of that? And so uh, this sort of information is always something to keep your uh, eye on. Now, as, as you heard uh, earlier, I, I have had some experience with the business of being the material scientist in a place uh, where people design big, complicated systems. And, and I, I, I show here my view of this. There's always the material scientist who says, new materials equals a better world. This uh, uh, photo is from Sandia National Lab. This happens to be an ex-student of mine, so I know he loves materials. Uh, this system, this gentleman is, uh, is uh, working on designing a, a reactor vessel for a nuclear power plant. And so uh, for him, always, new materials equals much higher risk. And so um, in that context for big complicated systems, they're really viewed as a necessary evil. That is, uh, no new materials unless I absolutely need them. And so in this context, and maybe we can talk about this more at the panel, the pull is much easier than the push. If you really need the material and there are no other alternatives, then uh, it's much more likely to get a material from the lab into a system. So the real problem at, at the root of all of this is that the process that you need to go through to get the material from the lab into a system just needs to be faster. It's incredibly slow. And if you've never been through this process, you may not realize that uh, some companies have very elaborate systems uh, for taking a, a material from uh, discovery to production. And uh, the systems are uh, typically laid out in technology readiness levels. They may be called something slightly different, but, but uh, there are many companies who have large um, systems, large handbooks, very detailed documentation on what constitutes making the step, say, from TRL-4 to TRL-5. And so a lot of things have to happen, and they're very expensive. And because they're often very experimentally um, intensive, make the component intensive, then uh, they're uh, difficult to do, and that's why the valley of the deaf is uh, here in the middle. And so um, if you look through the issue, you'll see that this business of being faster comes up a lot. And so uh, the, there's five or six papers here. And so Colin spent some time talking about Cost, that's a huge thing, and the other thing is speed. And so um, my focus here to uh, a, a greater degree will be uh, on speed. Now speaking of speed, uh, this goes back to, uh, to a development. So this development project consisted of uh, discovering a new um, single crystal material for aircraft engines. It's now known as Rene N6. And so this was actually um, my first uh, job as after I finished my PhD. And you don't need to look at the details here, but it's very revealing uh, what went into the patent. And so if you look closely at this table, you'll see a bunch of elements, and you'll see systematic two-level variations of the chemistry. And uh, this was absolutely the way that uh, everyone insisted that you discover a new material. So you design a large experimental matrix, you spend years uh, making small pieces of the material, and then somewhere in here you discover the uh, optimum. Now I'm a very impatient person. This is a slow process. You can see that by the time the patent's even filed, I'm already gone. I'm in Pittsburgh. And so, uh, and you can bet that it was many, many years later before this material actually flew in an engine. And so the real question is, how can we do all of these things faster? Now, the, the, when I say all of these things, I mean uh, not only uh, considerations of these uh, supply issues, but also 
other things like how do we design things faster, how do we predict what the properties are, how do we predict what the debits might be when we make uh, uh, more than just a handful of the material. Now this is, this is not really a, a new uh, problem. There have been many, many reports uh, over the years at the National Academies, for example, that have focused on the speed issue, the valley of death. And so I ask now what's different. And I think the thing uh, that is different and is changing the landscape very quickly is um, a couple of initiatives that are going on in the US and similar initiatives going on elsewhere in the world that have to do with the business of integrating uh, computation with experimental tools and big data in much more uh, intelligent ways than we've ever been able to do before. And so I show here a couple of reports, one in the US which was very helpful to pushing all this forward is a study um, on integrated computational materials engineering. Sharon Glatzer did a study on simulation-based science and engineering. Uh, ultimately, a lot of people investing time in uh, thinking about what is possible and how we can do this faster led to the Materials Genome Initiative, which is very poorly named, but that's what we have. The White House picked the name. So, uh, But this initiative really aims at developing new materials twice as fast at half the cost. And so again, these are the two big issues, speed and cost. And the focus of this uh, initiative is, is really the business of integrating computational tools, experimental tools, and digital data. This has been going on for a few years now, and I think there's been a lot of um, interesting and very hopeful things from the point of view of, of getting materials from the lab uh, into applications. And I'm not going to discuss this in detail, but I just show a few highlights here. Uh, first of all, there's the increasing computational power that we have. It's getting better and better every year, uh, including GPUs. And so that actually enables us to look at materials that are much more complicated than we were ever able to do uh, so before, and to do it in reasonable lifetimes, meaning graduate student lifetimes, because that's where a lot of the basic research is going on. There are projects, like the Materials Project uh, of Gerd Cedar and Kristen uh, Pearson at, at Berkeley that are building databases of material properties by uh, automating uh, DFT calculations and putting the results into databases. And uh, it's remarkable how fast the uh, information is accumulating. So one can now go and use this information without having to redo the calculations. So a tremendous resource. There are um, books on computation, uh, educational programs, summer schools, workshops that are emerging because uh, this way of uh, doing things in a more computational uh, intensive way, of course, requires uh, a lot of different uh, skills. There are uh, agencies who are now specifically asking, at least in the US, for uh, proposals which uh, combine uh, experiments, theory, computation, and, and, and really work at making those things um, work together and work together quickly. There are uh, new software uh, developments in terms of dealing with all the data. I show here uh, the Blue Quartz uh, software, which is really aimed at dealing with large 3D data sets. There are some informatics uh, companies that are emerging, and so uh, on all of these fronts, experiments, uh, computation, and, um, and data, we have a uh, fairly rapidly changing landscape, which I think is hopeful from this point of view. And then I'll just finish uh, by saying whenever people talk about the MGI or some of these other similar initiatives, there's always this reaction is uh, that we can't do everything computationally, and that's absolutely true. Uh, what we have to do is use experimental tools and, and computational tools together intelligently. And uh, so, Rightfully so, I think. There's an entire article about characterization in the issue, and uh, MRS has certainly not forgotten the importance of that. And so uh, what we need is characterization at all, all length scales, of course. 
We uh, need things like combinatorial synthesis. We need to bring forward ways of rapidly uh, designing and making materials. So there's a couple of articles about 3D printing. And so in all of these cases, again, we're starting to deal with big data problems. So the amount of data you can get from the synchrotron in a week uh, usually takes a year to process. And so um, there are some real opportunities in instrumentation in terms of automating uh, the data and automating the way we deal with it because doing it manually going forward is just not going to be possible. And I'll just give you one short example of our, our own situation with regard to the, to the 3D data. Now I'm going to show you uh, what motivated this uh, set of experiments that I'll show in, uh, in a second, but it's really the business of property prediction. So if, if you imagine whatever property you're interested in, in, in the context of the materials you're looking at, it, it could be a property which is sort of very sensitive to the nanostructure of the material, or it might be a property like fatigue that's very sensitive to the extremes uh, of the features in the material. And so uh, how well you need to know the material at any given link scale is of course dependent on what properties are important. And so we're getting pretty good at, at, at getting properties down here. And part of the reason why we're getting pretty good at that is that we don't really need to understand huge volumes of the material in great detail. However, if we're going to ever get around to sort of predicting some of these things up here, we're going to need a lot more information. So I, I show you here just one example of a new instrument which we've uh, developed to sort of address uh, that point and we call this system the tri-beam system. And basically what we've done is taken a, a, a focused ion beam platform and integrated a femtosecond laser with this system. And so uh, we call it the tri-beam because we now have an ultra short pulse laser uh, beam, 150 femtosecond pulses, the electron beam, the ion beam, and multimodal uh, detection so we can get crystallography, we can get chemistry, we can get structure and morphological distribution. And back to the speed issue, we can do this fast. So you've all seen focused ion beam 3D data sets. They have usually taken about six months to gather. This is a million times faster because the femtosecond laser can remove material layer by layer without any significant collateral damage. So I'll just show you one example of a material to make the point that it's, it's fairly materials blind approach. Uh, we can put a polymer under the beam. We can put here in this case, a, a mixture of tungsten and copper. So two very different materials and remove uh, material layer by layer and get the kind of high fidelity information that's needed to develop property models. So I show here a movie of the material coming off the surface of the copper tungsten composite, you can see a few voids here, and uh, basically uh, the material removal is now free. It takes a few seconds uh, to remove the material. It of course takes much more time if you want to get chemical information or crystallographic information. And so you can fully automate this and uh, get those sorts of data sets now in a couple of days. And so here, for example, is that data set, 30 hours worth of it. And then we again have a data problem because uh, in every slice there's about a gigabyte of information and these, can, uh, these data sets, if, depending on how much information you get, uh, gather, can quickly become terabytes in size. That does bring up the question how much information is enough and uh, that goes back to, well, what property do we want to predict? And so in this case, this material you uh, sometimes intentionally use it and, and ablate the copper out for cooling purposes in, in hypersonic vehicles and things like that. Details don't matter. But what I show here is the big data set with subsamples. And what I'm doing is uh, changing the sample size and then calculating, in this case, uh, the uh, permeability because that will be important to uh, the ablation of the copper. Now for engineering properties, we don't just need kind of a mean prediction, we need statistics, right? Real engineering systems designed based on minimum properties. And so what we're trying to do here is build a methodology for doing that. And so what I show here um, on the property end, the modulus and the permeability, and 
I'm showing these properties as a function of the sample size that was uh, subsampled. And so now we can start assigning uh, properties with some degree of confidence. So I know the modulus of this material will converge at 95% confidence if I uh, sample um, a box that's 60 uh, cubic microns, for example. And so it gives uh, new ways of trying to um, be more quantitative about what we're doing uh, with the materials. And so you can do this for properties. You can also do it for aspects of microstructure. And so uh, in, in these sorts of systems, you have to converge everything, right? You have to converge uh, the microstructural uh, features as well as the property features. OK, so um, with that, I'll uh, wrap up by saying from the point of view of discovery, I think there's still much to be discovered. There's a little bit of speculation here about how fast we'll hit the wall and run out of discoveries. I don't think that wall is anywhere near. Uh, I would finish by saying that the theoretical computational data tools, experimental tools, these things are all speeding up dramatically. And that's precisely what we need in terms of uh, getting materials from the lab uh, into applications. And so uh, I, I will finish by encouraging everyone to read the very last article in the issue, which is entitled Materials for the 21st Century, What Will We Dream Up Next? So thank you very much.